Does the Bible condone drinking alcohol in moderation? Many Christians think so, and they quote certain scriptures to justify their belief, like Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, which says, And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Since it tells us not to be drunk with wine, they assume it's okay to drink as long as we don't get drunk. Furthermore, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 7 tells us, Go, eat your bread with joy, and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already accepted your works. Does this mean that God intended wine to be a blessing for us to gladden our hearts? The truth will surprise you, and I'm going to be talking all about that in this video as I present to you eight misunderstood Bible verses about alcohol. But before I do that, if you're looking for more inspiring Christian channels to subscribe to, I highly recommend Doug Batchelor's YouTube channel. Doug Batchelor has a lot of inspiring content on his channel, which is sure to strengthen your relationship with Jesus and help you gain a better understanding of God's Word. Some of the videos you can watch on Doug Batchelor's channel include What is the Abomination of Desolation? Shocking Truths About the Great Tribulation and How to Have Inner Peace. Click on the card on the upper right hand corner of the screen or the link in the video description to subscribe to Doug Batchelor and check out some of his videos today. Now back to misunderstood verses about alcohol. Let's get right into it. The first one is Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, which says, And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. This is a pretty self-explanatory scripture. Don't get drunk, which leads to dissipation. In other words, overindulgence of sensual pleasures and a lack of self-control. On the contrary, be filled with the Spirit, which leads to a holy life. This scripture is a condemnation of getting drunk, but also notice what it's not. It's not an endorsement of drinking alcohol in any amount. To say that this scripture endorses drinking alcohol in moderation is presumptuous. It's twisting the scripture to make it say something that it's not really saying, and that is satanic. Satan is the master of twisting God's words. The first time he did this was in the Garden of Eden, when he tempted Eve to eat the forbidden fruit in Genesis chapter 3. Verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The implication here is, God really didn't mean what he said. Verse 2 through 5 says, And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Here, Eve reiterates what God has said, and the devil basically tells her, that's not what God really meant at all. Go ahead, try the fruit and see for yourself. You won't die, rather, you'll become like God. And this is exactly what's happening with Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. The devil wants people to think it means what it doesn't say at all, and that is, drinking in moderation is acceptable. The next misunderstood Bible verse about alcohol is 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8, which says, Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given too much wine, not greedy for money. Since it says deacons must not be given too much wine, some conclude that means it's okay for them to be given over to some wine. In other words, drinking in moderation is okay. And the explanation for this verse is similar to the last verse I talked about. This is not an endorsement of drinking alcohol in moderation. It's a condemnation of drunkenness. What Timothy is outlining in this verse is qualifications for deacons, which includes not being given over to much wine. In other words, getting drunk. That doesn't mean that it's okay for deacons to drink in moderation, though. That's not what it says. And it's not safe to assume that. 
especially with a substance as destructive as alcohol. As a matter of fact, some studies claim that alcohol is the most destructive drug in the world. An online post entitled 10 Reasons Why Alcohol is the Most Dangerous Drug in the World by TheDawnRehab.com states, a recent scientific study found that the most dangerous drug happens to be alcohol. One of the reasons for its ranking is due to the harm to other people as well as the wider economy. On a surface level, the results may seem shocking, but in reality, with over 3.3 million annual deaths, the outcome should come as less of a surprise. The World Health Organization estimates that 5.9% of all yearly deaths are caused by alcohol, which means that one person dies from alcohol every 10 seconds. Some of you may be saying, but that only happens with people who consume large amounts of alcohol. I'm a moderate drinker. I only drink one beer a day after work or a glass of wine with dinner. But not even moderate drinking is safe. An online post entitled Alcohol and Public Health by the CDC states, Emerging evidence suggests that even drinking within the recommended limits may increase the overall risk of death from various causes such as from several types of cancer and some forms of cardiovascular disease. Alcohol has been found to increase the risk of cancer. And for some types of cancer, the risk increases even at low levels of alcohol consumption, less than one drink in a day. Alcohol is a toxic carcinogen. Not only that, alcohol use is responsible for countless broken homes, financial problems, strained relationships, and it contributes to homelessness. All these things considered, do you think God wants us to have anything to do with alcohol? I don't think so. I think it's the devil that wants to convince us to drink alcohol, to try it, like Eve with the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. And we see how that ended up. The third verse in our lineup is Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 7. It says, Go, eat your bread with joy, and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already accepted your works. I watched a video online where a pastor quoted this verse and interpreted it to mean that fermented wine is a blessing from God meant to gladden our hearts. At face value, it may look that way until you understand how the word wine is used in the Bible. The word wine in the Bible means the fruit of the vine in its unfermented form, which is grape juice, or its fermented alcoholic form. That's why you don't see the word grape juice in the Bible. Grape juice is simply called wine. And that's why there's so much confusion about this topic. One example of the word wine being used in the place of grape juice is Isaiah chapter 65 verse 8, which says, As the new wine is found in the cluster, and one says, Do not destroy it, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servant's sake, that I may not destroy them all. Notice that it calls the juice that you find in a cluster of grapes, which is grape juice, new wine. And notice that it's specifically this type of wine that God pronounces a blessing on. You don't see a blessing pronounced on fermented wine in the Bible, quite the contrary. For example, Daniel chapter 1 verse 8 says, But Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Daniel considered it defiling to drink the king's wine. If Daniel was being served grape juice, I doubt that Daniel would have this same attitude, since the Bible pronounces a blessing on grape juice, so this must have been fermented wine. And 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 16 through 17 states, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Defiling your body with things God has forbidden is a serious offense with eternal consequences. Is it worth taking that chance to consume alcoholic beverages? Daniel didn't think so. And I don't think so either. And if you don't think so as well, make sure to give this video a like and subscribe to my channel and click the bell if you're new so you get notified about my future uploads. Next on our list, we have 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23, 
which says, No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. Here the Apostle Paul instructed Timothy to drink a little wine to alleviate stomach problems he was having. Timothy accompanied Paul on some missionary trips throughout the Roman Empire, so it's quite possible that the water Timothy drank from the different locations he visited wasn't suitable for his stomach and it caused him problems, like cramps and diarrhea. This still happens today. They call it traveler's diarrhea. One theory is that Paul told Timothy to drink some fermented wine so that the alcohol could kill the bacteria that was causing his traveler's diarrhea. And if that's the case, we are no longer talking about drinking wine for recreational purposes, but for medical purposes. So this verse is not a justification for recreational drinking. I used to think this theory was credible, but in light of more knowledge I gained about this subject, I'm beginning to believe it wasn't fermented wine that Paul was telling Timothy to drink at all. One of the reasons is because alcohol doesn't improve traveler's diarrhea. It makes it worse. An online post entitled Traveler's Diarrhea by the Mayo Clinic states, If you do get traveler's diarrhea, avoid caffeine, alcohol, and dairy products, which may worsen symptoms or increase fluid loss but keep drinking fluids. Alcohol can irritate your digestive tract and worsen diarrhea. Not to mention, it's important to hydrate yourself as much as possible if you're suffering from traveler's diarrhea, and alcohol is not a good way to do that since it's a diuretic and promotes dehydration. However, drinking fruit juices is recommended if you have traveler's diarrhea. The online post continues, drink canned fruit juices, weak tea, clear soup, decaffeinated soda or sports drinks to replace lost fluids and minerals. So Paul's suggestion to Timothy to drink a little wine for his stomach's sake was probably about drinking grape juice to help him stay hydrated. Also, some Bible scholars think Timothy may have taken the Nazarite vow, which required him to abstain from any products that came from the vine plant, including grape juice, grapes, and fermented wine. But in light of Timothy's stomach problems, Paul may have been advising him to go ahead and drink a little grape juice because his health was more important than his vow. This is along the lines of the principle, God desires mercy rather than sacrifice. The fifth verse I'd like to talk about is Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 29. That's when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. It says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. People often point to the Lord's Supper to claim that Jesus drank wine so we could drink wine too since he's our example. But I want you to notice something very important here. It doesn't even say the word wine. Jesus said, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine. The drink that comes directly from the fruit of the vine is grape juice. Not to mention, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper during the Passover. Verses 17 through 19 say, Now on the first day of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. This is significant because nothing leavened was to be found in their houses during the Passover. Speaking of the Passover, Exodus chapter 12 verse 19 says, For seven days no leaven shall be found in your house. Since whoever eats what is leavened, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a stranger or a native of the land. Leaven is yeast that is used to make dough rice. That's why flatbread is eaten during the Passover. But fermented wine is leavened as well. 
because it is yeast that causes grapes to ferment and become alcoholic. In addition, the wine that Jesus and his apostles drank during the Lord's Supper was a symbol of his blood. Unfermented wine is more of a fitting symbol for his pure, holy blood than fermented wine which is toxic and intoxicating. Next in our list of misunderstood Bible verses about alcohol is 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 20 through 21. It says, Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry, and another is drunk. This is talking about the Lord's Supper, and it mentions the Corinthians getting drunk. So some people conclude that the wine which early Christians drank for the Lord's Supper must have been intoxicating because you can't get drunk on grape juice. But I don't think this is evidence that early Christians drank fermented wine during the Lord's Supper. Rather, I think it's an example of how the Corinthians corrupted the ceremony of the Lord's Supper by making it like one of their pagan celebrations. You have to remember the Corinthians were newly converted pagans, and so they were used to feasting and drinking intoxicating wine to excess in their pagan ceremonies. Apparently what had happened is they had corrupted the ceremony of the Lord's Supper to be like their pagan feasts and Paul was condemning them for it. Luke chapter 7 verses 33 through 34 is another verse some people quote as evidence Jesus drank alcohol. It says, For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Look, a glutton and a wine-bibber a friend of tax collectors and sinners. The Pharisees accused Jesus of being a wine-bibber, which means a habitual drinker of alcohol. Now, obviously that was not true. The Pharisees made all kinds of accusations against Jesus that were not true. Like he broke the Sabbath and was demon-possessed, to name a few. But some people think that Jesus must have, at times, drank some fermented wine for the Pharisees to accuse him of being a wine-bibber. However, if any time was a good time for Jesus to drink wine, it would have been at the crucifixion. Matthew chapter 27 verse 34 says, They gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink, but when he had tasted it, he would not drink. This was an intoxicating concoction given to people being crucified in order to dull their pain. But Jesus refused it because he knew that at this crucial hour of his mission, he needed to maintain a clear mind and alcohol impairs your judgment. Isaiah chapter 28 verse 7 gives this warning about consuming alcohol. The priests and the prophet have erred through intoxicating drink. They are swallowed up by wine. They are out of the way through intoxicating drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. It's a scientific fact that even one alcoholic beverage impairs your judgment. So I can't imagine Jesus drinking any fermented wine during his crucifixion or throughout his life because it would have given Satan an advantage over him. The next scripture on my list is Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 26, which says, And spend the money for whatever you desire, oxen or sheep or wine or strong drink, whatever your appetite craves, and you shall eat there before the Lord your God and rejoice, you and your household. People read this and assume it's an approval of consuming wine and strong drink. Now the difference between wine and strong drink is, strong drink was more potent than wine. Wine in Bible times was generally around 5-7% to alcohol, while strong drink was anything above that to about 11% alcohol. And even though there are verses in the Bible which condone drinking wine, sometimes because grape juice is called wine, there are no verses condoning strong drink. Because strong drink always refers to intoxicating beverages. For instance, Proverbs chapter 20 verse 1 says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. So how can we make sense of Deuteronomy chapter 14 verse 26? First of all, notice that there was no instruction to drink the wine and strong drink which was purchased in this passage. It only said they were to eat what they purchased, which was oxen and sheep. Secondly, this was part of a tithe offering. 
If you read the context of this passage, starting in verse 22, it explains that the Israelites were to tithe the increase of the grain, new wine, oil, and firstborn of their herds and flocks to the Lord. If the journey was too long for them to where they were to offer their tithe, then they were instructed to exchange their tithe for money and use the money to purchase oxen, sheep, wine, or strong drink when they reached their destination. However, drink offerings that contained alcohol were not to be drunk. They were to be poured out on the ground. And speaking of drink offerings, Numbers chapter 28 verse 7 says, its drink offering shall be a quarter of a hen for each lamb. In the holy place, you shall pour out a drink offering of strong drink to the Lord. So the Lord permitted the Israelites to purchase fermented wine for the purpose of making offerings, not for drinking. One of the reasons may be is because fermented wine was more available than unfermented wine or fresh grape juice. It was probably impossible to find grape juice for a whole nation of people who were assembling to worship the Lord, but fermented wine was abundant. Big thanks to all of you who support my channel with your prayers and donations. If you haven't already, please pray for my channel so that God may continue using it to reach people with the gospel. And if you'd like to make a donation to help support my social media ministry, you can make a one-time donation through PayPal or a monthly pledge through Patreon. Links to my PayPal and Patreon accounts are in the video description. There are no Bible verses that condone drinking alcohol in moderation. Just because the Bible says not to get drunk doesn't mean it's okay to drink in moderation. You really have to twist the scriptures to come to that conclusion. When Paul told Timothy to drink a little wine, even if it was fermented, it was for medical purposes. So that's not a justification for recreational drinking. Daniel refused to drink the king's wine because he didn't want to defile himself. And the kind of wine that God blessed for us to enjoy is the fresh juice of the cluster, which is grape juice. Also, Jesus did not drink fermented wine neither during the Lord's Supper nor during the crucifixion to dull his pain. And just because the Pharisees accused him of being a wine-bibber doesn't mean he drank. They accused him of a whole lot of things that weren't true. In addition, recent studies suggest that no amount of drinking is safe, not even in moderation. After watching this video, do you think it's a sin for Christians to drink alcohol even in moderation? Let me know in the comments section. By the way, this video is a three-part series on alcohol and wine in the Bible. Other things I've talked about in this series are reasons why Christians should never drink alcohol and the miracle of Jesus turning water into wine. Click on the screen to watch those videos now. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it to help spread God's word. Thank you for watching and God bless you.